Good morning, everybody, whether in the church or whether further apart. It's great to be with you this morning. Just a few notices before we start. There's a funeral of Lawrence Hadley. We'll be here at 8 at St. Stephen's on Thursday at 11.30. There's a plate for the harvest flowers at the back of the church. And the men's breakfast is on this Saturday, September the 18th at 10 a.m. in the Malt Shovel in Shardlow. So we start on page one of our Red Book books. In name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. According to St Mark. Glory, Glory to you, to you O Lord. Lord. The reading from Mark chapter 8, beginning at verse 27. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, Who do people say that I am? And they replied, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others say that you're one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. been a centre of Baal worship, pagan worship, it was believed that Greek god of nature Pan was born there. It was the furthest north, right on the edge of Israel. The rabbis called it the very edge between the Holy Land and the pagans. And on a large hill close to it was a vast white marble temple um, built in honour of the Roman Caesar who was believed to be a god, and it was built by the Tetrarch Philip, hence um, Caesarea Philippi. It got its name from the temple. Isn't it incredible that it was there in that, well, it, it really a pagan place, right on the edge of the Holy Land, that Jesus was interested in what people were saying about him. And um, almost exactly... Halfway through the Gospel, Mark's Gospel, the 16 chapters, we get this in verse 29. But what about you? Who do you say I am? It's a question we all have to answer for ourselves at some point. And Peter says, you are the Christ. It's the first time we've heard that word since Mark chapter 1, verse 1. And as You'll all know Christ is a Greek translation of a Hebrew word, the Messiah, and it simply means the anointed one. The one the Jews believed was coming to bring God's salvation. We have to go to Matthew's account for Jesus' rather fuller version. Matthew 16 verse 17. <laughs> Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. What's he saying there? That when Peter recognised him as the Christ, it was a divine revelation. You know, we often think that our knowledge of Jesus comes from our reason, that human ability to think based on evidence and argument. Of course we need to grow in an understanding of Jesus based on our reason. But I believe... Just take the Christmas narratives, for example. 
all the main characters, and I've got a list here in pencil, Zechariah, Mary and Joseph, the Magi, the shepherds, Simeon and the prophetess Anna, eight days later when Jesus was taken to the temple. All of the main characters came to Jesus and gained an understanding of Jesus through divine revelation. What do I mean by that? Angels and dreams, a star, the power and prompting of the Holy Spirit and insights into ancient scripture. You see what I'm saying? So I'd like to say to you, if you're inquiring for yourself about who Jesus is, pray for the divine illumination of the Holy Spirit. It is a game changer. Maybe you're praying for someone else to come to faith. And it's been a long time since you started to pray. Pray for the divine illumination on their own natural human reason. It's a game changer. I'd like to read you this. <laughs> it was sent to me in the week. A grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own, so she likes other people's little girls and boys. This is written by a tiny little girl. A grandfather is a man grandmother. <laughs> he goes for walks with the boys and they talk about fishing and tractors. Grandmothers don't have to do anything but just be there. They are old and so they shouldn't play hard or run. Usually they are fat, that's not true, but that's this child's perspective. But not too fat to tie children's shoes. They wear glasses and funny underwear and they can take their teeth and gums off. <laughs> they don't have to be smart, only answer questions like why dogs hate cats and why God isn't married. That's a good question, isn't it? They don't talk baby talk like visitors. When they read to us, they don't skip bits or mind if it's the same story over and over and over again. Everyone should have a grandmother, especially if they don't have television, because grandmothers are the only grown-ups who have time. Um, my grandmother, when I was growing up, had time for me. And she prayed for me. And so did my granddad. And I firmly believe that I'm here today because of the prayers of my nanny and granddad, who prayed that the Holy Spirit would speak to me and reveal the Christ to me. And that happened to me, as many of you know, when I was a young soldier in a very difficult situation. We need the illumination and revelation of the Spirit to have a fuller picture of who Jesus is. But did you notice verse 30? This is so enigmatic. Peter has this revelation. And what does Jesus say? Don't tell anybody. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone. If you read through Mark's gospel, you find Jesus says that quite a lot, particularly after miracles and healings, as he comes off the Mount of Transfiguration. Why on earth would Jesus say to people, Shh, don't tell anybody who I am. Scholars call it the messianic secret. In that culture, there was a deeply ingrained understanding about the Christ. And it was all tied up with politics and warfare. He was going to be a kind of Superman figure, crashing into history to utterly smash the enemies of the Jews and renew Jerusalem. Here's Jesus' vision. Mark 8 verses 31. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. And after three days, rise again. He spoke plainly about this. Do you see what Jesus is doing? He's connecting his messiahship, his Christly nature, with suffering and pain, which was completely crazy, ridiculous and countercultural to the Jews like Peter. They'd never heard anything like it before. Peter's vision 
was so ingrained that he just doesn't get it. So this is what we get. Um, Peter took Jesus aside and rebuked him. And Jesus turned and looked at his disciples. He rebuked Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. And Satan here just means opposer. Get behind me, opposer. Peter got the title right, but the meaning wrong. Do you know, sometimes I wonder, and I wonder if you have ever thought about this, I wonder if our images of Jesus need recasting a bit. I wonder which Jesus we follow. Maybe he's the Jesus of our grandparents and parents and Sunday school teachers. I'm not suggesting for one minute that's all wrong, but it may be their Jesus, not our Jesus, if you see what I mean. Maybe Jesus is the Jesus of our school or our church tradition or our societal culture. Again, it's not all wrong, but maybe it's not our Jesus. It's someone else's, a composite picture of Jesus. In my job, I understand that many people, they like the Christmas Jesus. Cute, cuddly, controllable. And we too can easily sentimentalise, romanticise, domesticate Jesus. And God forbid we end up with a Jesus who looks not dissimilar to us. He's our Jesus. A Jesus defined by our politics, our priorities, our paradigms, our kind of people. Jesus is our kind of guy. What about the Jesus who spoke the truth to power? Who whipped people in the temple? Who called people like me, the religious people, the priests, hypocrites, and I am? Who fed the poor? Who modelled a radical inclusivity? Who turned the other cheek? Who hung naked on a cross? What about that kind of Jesus? I wrote a poem about this and I want to read it to you. I've slightly amended it because I thought it was a bit close to the bone. So I've just slightly amended it for my kind of people. God came to church today and didn't rush away, as so many often do after the allotted hour, but spoke to all with love and care. And I suddenly became aware of how much like the rest of us, God looked white, ageing, able-bodied, straight, smartly dressed. Some said that was good because it meant God understood the way we like things here and that God could stay as long as he promised never to get in the way. Perhaps we need to meet Jesus again for the first time. <laughs> to have a revelation of what the Christ means to us today to rediscover our first love and then to share Jesus with others because there's no messianic secret anymore. Finally, Jesus shares these electrifying words. Mark chapter 8, verse 34 to 35, if you have a Bible there in front of you. Then he called the crowd to him. He'd been speaking to his disciples. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and he said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. And Luke inserts one word. This is what you get in Luke chapter 9, 24. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me, daily. Well, I wanted to ask you a question. Um, what does take up your cross mean? Why don't we just think about that for just a few moments? What does take up your cross mean? Shall I give you my answer? Would anyone, would anyone like to proffer an answer doing the things Jesus asks us to do, which can be costly? 
Anyone else? Please. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. We're not used to this. We like rhetorical questions. Um, let, this, is, this is what I've got, and it ties in with what Sarah said. Being willing to die, because that's what crucifixion is about, to our own selfishness and self-centeredness. So doing the things Jesus wants us to do. But it is about death, isn't it? Crucifixion. It was essential that Peter and the others should grasp the conditions of messiahship for Jesus, what it meant to be Christ. Otherwise, they wouldn't grasp the conditions of discipleship for themselves. They'd do things differently. By divine paradox, spiritual life is found by the way of dying to self. That's what he says here in these words. We lose our lives and find them again in the service of sharing and living out the good news of Jesus. It sounds so countercultural, so bizarre, so paradoxical particularly in a culture like ours that is focused on the individual and our needs and pleasures. In giving our lives to Jesus, we can discover total freedom and such lives can have a profound impact for good on the world God so loves. I believe that's what Mark is writing in these words. Let me finish with this story. Yesterday, like me, you would have watched and heard some of the um, reflections on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Uh, I, I was in tears. I don't know if any of you saw them reading out the names at Ground Zero. And then each person that read finished with saying a final name which was related to them. My dad, John. My, my auntie, Jean. Uh, my son. My uncle. I mean, God, it was so moving. And seeing the images again, it, it's just, I, I'll never understand or get over what happened, ever. You may know that the first known victim, recorded victim, clearly others had died before him as those planes crashed into the tower. But the first recorded victim, victim 0001, in the records was Father Michael Judge, a Franciscan priest. Father Michael lived in a consumer society and owned nothing apart from his habit and a, and a Bible. He had nothing. He was a chaplain to the New York Fire Department and when he heard what was happening he took off his habit, he got in his chaplain's gear and he rushed to grounds, what we know as Ground Zero. And he entered, I think it was Tower 1. And he was ministering to those people in that place when his head was struck by some debris and he died instantly. And if you go onto the internet, you can easily see a picture of his body being carried out by some firemen. And they took him out and they laid his body by the altar of a, of a church near, nearby and prayed for him. He saved their lives because when the tower came down, they were with him or they were outside of the tower. Father Michael went there and died because of this teaching of Jesus. Take up your cross daily and follow me. He had a profound impact on the people around him and on me and I suspect on you and on many others. There is a picture of a man who took up his cross and made a difference. And there is a challenge for you and I. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So please close your eyes and place your hands, palm upwards, on your lap. Become aware of all the issues, questions and concerns that you have brought with you. The unfinished business, the sticky relationships, the work that awaits you, the decisions that have to be taken. Hold all these things in your hands. Feel the weight of them. Recognize that they are part of you at this moment and that you have come to church with them today.
Now turn your hands over so that your palms are facing downwards on your lap. And as you turn your palms over, feel that these issues and concerns slipping away, falling out of your hands. Let them fall into the hands of God, who is always there to catch everything that needs to be caught. Let yourself release to him all those things you don't need to keep hold of. Feel the freedom, the lightness, the love as those concerns fall away. Now turn your hands over again, so that your hands are facing upwards. Now your hands are open, but empty, no longer carrying the weights and burdens that they were before, but ready to receive all the good things God has given to you and can give to you. God always wants to give us far more than we can imagine. Be open to receiving whatever that is today, for yourself and for others, be open. So as we come together in prayer on this Sunday, let us reflect on those things that we would like to see changed in our world. The things we would like to see changed in our nation and community. And the things we would need to help change ourselves. So your kingdom come, and we say, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your, your will be done. <laughs> Lord, we seem so capable of damaging your beautiful world, showing hatred and violence. And in so doing, we overwhelm your plan of love. Night after night, on our TV, we see people's homes destroyed, <coughs> hospitals crowded with injured people, people lacking food and clean water, and grieving families burying their dead, remembering especially the families of those of who died at 9-11. We keep getting it so wrong. Forgive us, Lord, and help us to strive to show your transforming love wherever we are in the world. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we seem to get so many things wrong closer to home. We hear of corruption, greed, people lacking housing and finding it hard to pay their bills, the elderly feeling lonely, and young families struggling to cope. These are things that are happening here in our own community. Lord, make us aware of the needs of our neighbours and help us to be prepared to show them love and help them. Forgive us when we walk by on the other side. Help us to show your love wherever we are and wherever we go. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, may we reflect on your world, your creation, on this country and this community and church. Help us to reflect on ways we should be changed and transformed by in ourselves. We pray that this time, when we align ourselves to God's transforming love and be changed by it, and as we are changed, we may help the lives of others. Reflecting God's love in the world, your kingdom come, your will be done. Lord, we hear of and know people who are ill, who are anxious and bewildered, and who fear what the next day will bring. We know that you walk with all your precious children. We pray that those who we are aware of may know and surround themselves with your love. We also remember those who have died and may they rest in peace and rise in glory. Comfort those who have worn, hold them in your loving embrace. We know we are not always good at caring for people around us, so forgive us and help us show your love to those we know who are in need, who are sick, who are grieving. Your kingdom come. Your will. Please place your hands back on your lap, palm upwards. Ask God to give you back those things that you need to deal with and which he has kept safe. Some things you may find you don't need to take back. 
Some things may come back subtly changed, for God has been holding them. Be ready to take your responsibilities. Be always, but always know that God loves you and shares them with you. God is holding you in the palm of his hand. And we say together, Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And the blessing and dismissal. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Father, lead us forward this week, remembering those things which happened those years ago, remembering that you are all always with us, walking daily with us, and may we daily pick up your cross and ride with it, taking it and centering it in everything we do. Amen. Please be careful this week. Keep safe. Please go out this way, passing the cross, and thinking about the cross. I carry a little cross with me every single day. I can get it out of my pocket. I'll let you know, show it. It reminds me when I carry my cross with me. It helps me with prayer. Maybe something you could think of. Have a great week. God bless. Bye-bye.